So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think as you all know, I'm Brian Hacker from the Department of Planning and Development, and this is our monthly uh, community roundtable meeting for the uh, Ogden Avenue, North Lawndale, and West Southwest uh, corridor slash community. Uh, all right, get our presentation going here. And uh, so, on the agenda for today's meeting, um, we can start with uh, introductions, uh, and uh, then we're going to get into the results of the survey that uh, was conducted with assistance from uh, our partners at, over at LISC about how we can best engage with the uh, Invest Southwest communities and how we can make the best use of our time at these monthly roundtable meetings. So, uh, and we've got uh, Claudette Baker, who is a, a, a partner of DPD uh, joining us. She's going to be helping us facilitate that conversation, uh, as well as uh, Caroline Rendon from uh, LISC, who has joined us, you know, for quite a while now. Uh, they will be taking the lead on that conversation. And uh, I'll also, at the end of the meeting, just be giving a brief kind of roundup or uh, project update on some of the major uh, developments that DPD and uh, other partners have going on in the, in the community. Um, so at this point, uh, I think, Claudette, would you like to uh, jump in and just say hello and uh, introduce yourself to the, the group? Apologies for not having a, a bio slide for you. It's okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And it's been a while, I think, uh, since I've been here when uh, you had the presentations from um, the various developers. But I'm Claudette Baker. Um, I'm an independent consultant to nonprofits and foundations and to the city. Um, my role today is once the results are presented by Caroline from uh, LISC, is that we have some questions we want to get your reaction to um, the survey results and also your input as to you know how these community roundtables can uh, where they need improvement uh, and who should facilitate. And so I look forward to that conversation um, shortly. So I'll hand it back to you, Brian, or you want to pass it on to Caroline? Uh, just a sec before we get going on that, I think um, we don't usually do introductions for everybody who joins the meeting since you know, most folks know each other, but I'm not sure, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Dr. Sampson uh, joining us today. So I wanted, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to introduce yourself to the group. Uh, I so. did the last time, but did I you? am Myra Sampson, uh, and I am the CEO and principal of CCA Academy, um, a charter school, and we've been in North Lawndale for 43 years. Okay, great. Apologies for uh, getting no problem last, last time there. Uh, so, but yeah, great to have you joining us again. Um, Okay, so yeah, uh, I think uh, we can hand it over here to uh, Caroline from LISC and just please give me the cues for when you'd like me to uh, advance the, the slides and take care of that for you. So uh, go ahead, Caroline, all yours. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Pardon me, I think I know many of you, but uh, for those who don't, I'm Caroline Rendon. I'm a program officer with LISC Chicago. And one of the projects we're working on is um, partnering with DPD uh, to sort of evaluate the roundtables, understand how they're going, and um, what concrete things we can commit to together to ensure that they are a really effective forum for community engagement and input. Um, so next slide. We, um, we've developed a process to sort of do that. Uh, first was a survey. I've popped into a couple of your last roundtables to plead <laughs> with all of you to, to take the survey and to ensure that it gets out to uh, other folks who may not have been on the meeting. Um, so I'll share some of the high level results from that survey in a moment. Uh, the next step is, is where we are now, really wanting to talk sort of face-to-face -face as much as possible on Zoom about, um, about the roundtables, what, what's going well, what would we wanna see different in the future and um, how can we work together to make that happen? We'll then sort of 
take on some of those changes. Some might be really easy, some might be a little more difficult, more complicated and take some time. And then towards the end of the year, once we've made a couple changes, we'll be able to look back and, and, and evaluate that. What, what about this worked? Should we keep going the way we're going? Should we think about different options and so forth? Next slide. So again, I'm gonna give a really high level overview of the survey results before I turn it over to Claudette. Um, this is not by any stretch the full sort of overall results. We can share those with you at a later point. We have a much longer slide deck um, with all of the responses, but I wanna highlight a couple of things that we saw. So first we wanted to figure out uh, who actually was responding to this survey. People were able to check as many boxes as they felt applied to them. Uh, and we got a, a, a good representation from residents, people who own property in and around the neighborhood in the corridor, community organizations, staff, um, other folks, sometimes older people, older people's staff, those kinds of people. Next slide. And I'll add also, we got just over a hundred responses across the whole Invest Southwest footprint. And so what you're seeing here is the results across all of the, all um, 10 of the neighborhoods represented in this initiative. Um, we didn't get quite enough responses from any one neighborhood to narrow down just on that one. Um, so what you're seeing is citywide. <clears throat> So the, one of the questions we asked is like, would you agree that the, the round table is an effective forum for getting community engaged and getting feedback? <clears throat> Pardon me. And most people about three quarters in the blue said yes, either strongly agreed with that statement or agreed. But there's still a substantial minority that do not feel that the, uh, the, the round tables are effective in this realm, of getting feedback on projects. Um, so there's certainly some work to do here. Next slide. We also asked people a related question about whether they feel that they have power to influence decisions in their neighborhood. And about a third, that blue section of the graph is people who said, yes, I do feel like I have more ability to influence the decision-making in my neighborhood. About half said there was no change, that's the gray section. And 14% said, I actually feel less power in, uh, in influencing decisions in my neighborhood. So again, there's still, um, still a substantial amount of work to be done to ensure that people feel like the round tables actually are a forum for them to do this and that they, their voices matter in how investment decisions are made. Next slide. We also asked some sort of practical questions about what the roundtables should look like kind of month to month or however frequently they happen, uh, including what would be the best way to have these facilitated. Um, should we uh, stick with having Brian lead these every month? Should there be some, some sort of combination of folks who take the charge on this? Um, about half of the respondents said it should be a combination of entities that take on the, uh, the hosting and the facilitation of the roundtable. Um, so that might be between um, DPD and a community organization, the corridor manager, some other kind of neighborhood entity. So that's something we could dig into further in conversation. Um, but I think it's clear that people wanted to see a diversity of, of folks at the head of the round table, um, not necessarily just one entity. Next slide. We asked too about uh, meeting format. This has kind of gone back and forth over the last couple of years about uh, what folks are comfortable with in terms of meeting with others, but um, with the mask mandate ending tomorrow, there's sort of a new opportunity to reconsider. Do we wanna keep meeting virtually? More meetings in person, half and half, what are folks comfortable with? So across the responses, we saw people wanting to keep it mostly virtual. Um, but it, but uh, adding in some in-person occasionally, whether it was every other meeting, every third meeting, something like that um, would, be, would be valuable because we know it's, it's different to be in a room, uh, a real room together. Next slide. We had, pardon me, an open-ended question sort of what, what was one change we could make to the round tables that would um, help people feel more engaged in this. And they, uh, 
we have a, we got a lot of responses, an open-ended question with 100 people who responded to the survey, we got 100 different answers. But some of the common themes that we saw <clears throat> was to make sure that people, um, people all over the neighborhood know that the roundtable is happening, engaging more stakeholders in this. Um, wanted to see more transparency, more kind of clarity about what's coming down the pike and what influence stakeholders might have over some of those changes and decisions. Um, better community outreach, consistency on location and time, uh, that kind of thing. I think this, this uh, in this neighborhood, things have been pretty consistent, usually on Monday at 2 p.m. Uh, for the meetings, but um, that's not true in all neighborhoods. So people really wanted that kind of clarity and consistency. Next slide. All right, so again, those are just high level results. We can share the full, full um, set of results at a later point. Uh, but at this point, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Claudette to sort of talk through what we're noticing and what um, some steps can be uh, moving forward. If there are specific questions about the data, I'm also happy to entertain those. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so to the roundtable members, we want to start by getting your initial reaction to the results um, that you've seen, what strikes you about them. Uh, did anything um, jump out at you um, particularly? And if we need to go back to some slides, please let me know. Please do use the chat, or raise your hand. Uh, we can also popcorn. Okay, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Claudia. One of the things that I wonder, because we, we've heard this before about getting more community people involved. And I'm just wondering if there were any recommendations made from anyone in terms of how we do that. We did flyers, we did electronic, we did all kinds of things. So I'm just curious as to what else we might be able to do to get more folks involved. I, I agree with that, that, that idea. We should do that. I'm just wondering how we would do that. Yeah, I can, I can pull out some of the responses, uh, Rodney, and share them with yeah. you and the corridor manager team more specifically, because there was sort of a, a type your feedback in option, okay. not part of the high level overview, but um, I can share a little bit more. I think also it may be that um, that's a sentiment shared more in other neighborhoods than this one. If you all have oh, been doing okay. flyers and that sort of thing, not mm -hmm. every neighborhood has. Okay, gosh, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Green? Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I think I was a bit stunned by the number of responses that we got across the city. I thought that was just North Lawndale at first, Caroline. I didn't realize that was across the city. So I would probably piggyback on what Rodney question is and try to dig deeper into that and figure out how do we increase the responses uh, to these surveys. Uh, I would say that I, I, I guess I wasn't struck by some uh, most of the outcomes of the responses as it relates to individuals uh, feeling like they have power, those who still there's a segment of the population that still like they still are in the same place or less power because they feel like things are going on around them opposed to being a part of it. Um, uh, uh, and as it relates to the the um, the leading of the roundtables, we've had some conversation about that. So it was good to see that that was in line with what we were thinking as well, a combination of city folks, community folks. Uh, and then I would I would even add some of the, our uh, partners who are going to be doing the development to actually lead some of the roundtables as well. Thank you. And I'm sure um, Caroline would like to hear if you all have suggestions as to how you can get an increase in the response uh, to the surveys. Uh, that was one thing that was um, discussed across um, the various roundtables and just internally is the response rate. So um, if you have some suggestions around that, um, please do offer them up. Any other uh, initial thoughts around these results before uh, we move on to the next question? Hi, this is Kristen Freeman. Um, I'm actually one who did not respond to the survey. I didn't see the survey. So I'm not sure of the mechanism of distribution or the frequency of distribution, um, but I can say social media is really good. I've been seeing the mayor's office do an increasingly 
updated and progressive kind of Instagram um, campaign. And I see a lot of their messaging. Um, so I would say the survey needs to come from multiple sources. So just as many should be sending it out. Um, I know there's office. I know the mayor's office is doing something weekly. So I think the, 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 the frequency as well as the mechanisms of distribution would likely need to be increased. Um, and I'm not sure if there's going to be another open survey period, but if it does happen, um, I would be happy to complete the survey. Thank you for that. I think we heard most of it may have just gone out on my end, um, but uh, numerous channels or different channels, ways of disseminating uh, the survey and calling attention to it. Thank you. Um, so um, let's move on. And as you've seen from the results, um, that people feel good that the roundtables uh, do exist and it's a good way to provide feedback. But why do you think um, people are, don't have the confidence uh, that their feedback is being incorporated into the decisions that are being made? What's underneath that? Uh, this is Deborah. I think it's just historical perspective experience. You know. Uh, can you say more about that? What do you mean, historical perspective experience? Yeah, I'm, I'm even you know when um, there are some. I'm not going to say all, but there's some um, community members that feel like. Uh, I told you, or this is what my preference is, but it wasn't, um, they don't see the result of it, of their input. And, you know, uh, it's that power chain that, uh, that you mentioned in, in your presentation that you don't feel like uh, the, their voice is being uh, heard, um, you know, so that's what I mean. Okay, so inaction on suggestions that have been made previously um, for a while that there hasn't been any uh, action taken on what has been suggested. Yeah, or uh, not being done in the way that, that the community feels that it should be. I mean, I, I, I frankly, I'm concerned that the, the response is so low because I don't even know if it's statistically significant um, when you put all of the Invest Southwest um, together for a hundred, just a little over a hundred responses. That's, I mean, how do you make valid decisions with that small of a uh, response? I don't know. Right, and they did recognize, uh, I think in talking about that, Caroline, if you wanna address that about the significance of the sample, the small sample size. Sure. Yeah, it's certainly not ideal. I think um, I think my, my aim, at least with the survey, was to get us to some kind of starting point for this conversation. I think it's it's totally open to you all to say that doesn't reflect my experience at all, uh, because that sample size is so small, uh, and because the um, the the responses are aggregated across the city. So I really do want to treat it as sort of a conversation starter and some areas where we can explore. I think there are some trends there that I've, I personally have seen in, in various neighborhoods across the, the Invest Southwest footprint. Um, but you're right, we don't have to take this as gospel truth. I think, I think the bigger question is like, is this round table working for you? If so, great. And what can we do even better? How can we ensure that other community members have a, an experience this positive? Or if it's not working for you, what can we change? Um, other thoughts or comments, and to add to that, as Caroline stated, it has been consistent across at least, you know, two communities that I know of in terms of the historical perspective and the feedback that you're offering there around, you know, what the action has been or the uh, inaction to implement um, some of the suggestions um, to the city. Other comments around uh, this particular question as to why people may feel less confident 
uh, that their feedback is being incorporated. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, what would make this more effective? Um, this forum, the roundtables for community engagement. How do you get the community more engaged around um, the activities that are going on? Um, hi, it's Kristen again. I, I think one of the things is, especially for um, depending on your job, the time that the round table is occurring is during someone's work day. Um, so most of us who are at the table have some sort of professional tie to this work. But as a resident, it may be difficult to take an hour out of a day that's not A, your lunch hour, or B, after work um, to participate in the process, as well as the fact that sometimes the, the information that's presented may require some additional, let me sit with this time. And so it would be helpful if information is sent out again in multiple formats at multiple times and even in more bite-sized ways so that by the time the round table does occur, there is some, some viable opportunity for feedback and engagement but also if there is alternative times that may be made available for multiple stakeholders to participate. Thank you. So timing of the meetings and dissemination of information. Um, this, is, this is Rodney. I, I would also wonder if the fact that it's all been Zoom might have an impact on that as well as so people might have preferred to be in person and if that would be a difference in terms of people coming out and getting engaged. I, I agree with Tristan that you know, we may also need to look at how the information is disseminated you know, prior to the meeting, but I just wonder also if this Zoom op option didn't get tired for people after a while, because we did have a much better participation in the beginning of these calls than we're having at this point. And I think there was a slide that showed um, mixed um, to have virtual, yeah. a combination of virtual and yeah. in person. Um, I also want to call your attention to the note in the chat from um, Brenda Palms around some people may feel that the decisions have already been made. So why participate? What's the value in participating? Any other comments? of um, what would make this more effective? You know, I, this is Brenda. Uh, I think it might be helpful if people see the impact of like even this survey. I mean, I'm not sure if this is the one we wanna go with, but you know, always helping people to understand that, you know, circle back and say, here's what was said. So they know that it doesn't just sort of go into this abyss somewhere. They never, they never um, hear their voices or their opinions um, represented. So a report out? Yeah. Okay. Other thoughts? All right, and lastly, who should um, facilitate the round tables and how often should you meet? I think based on the uh, survey and what I think works best is is uh, the results that we got from the survey. It should be a mixture of uh, the uh, city, uh, stakeholders, uh, community organization, as well as developers uh, from the city. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and I think the one for me, uh, once a month is, is, is fine. And I also agree that it we probably should rotate one Zoom, one in-person, one Zoom, one in-person, whatever that mixture is. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree also there should be a mixture of the hosting options. It gives people an opportunity to see some different styles or whatever, but I, I think that might also get more people engaged. 
And then as, as it relates to the timing, I, I, I agree with Jesse in terms of once a month, but I guess we need to make sure also that to, to the point earlier, if we're going to do this, whether it's during the work day or after work, if we can also get the agenda out so people have an idea of what we're going to be talking about when we get there, that may also help. So um, once a month, an agenda and a mix. Yes. Of virtual and in person. And then also um, you um, want to call up as well what uh, Kristen stated about the timing of the yeah. meetings yeah. Um, for participation. Yeah. And maybe that also we need to look at rotating whether we have one in the afternoon and then the next one is in the evening because you're also going to have that conflict with folks who yeah. have little ones. Yeah. All right. So a rotation schedule for time of day. Mm -hmm. Anything else regarding um, the round tables? And for the next survey, might there be a question that should be asked that has not been asked? Um, for the round tables, are, when the meetings are recorded, where, where is the post meeting? Um, where is that information hosted in the distribution? So even if someone can't attend in person, they do have the opportunity to rewatch and then follow up as needed. So where is that information currently being housed and how is that information currently being promoted? Claudette, I can take that one, uh, just in case you're not familiar, but uh, this Brian, um, Chris and I, I sent out a follow-up email after every meeting uh, which you should be receiving that has a link to the um, recording, you know, just so if folks are not able to attend, they, you know, the, the day of the meeting or the following day, get the meeting with the, uh, sorry, get the email with the recording of the meeting. And then these are also all posted on the uh, DPD YouTube page. So that's just a, some, I think it's just like youtube.com slash Chicago DPD. So they're, they're easily accessible. Thanks, Brian. I'm sorry, you didn't hear me. Any other thoughts or questions that you might have? <laughs> This is Rochelle. Does DPD have a Facebook page? Brian? Uh, <laughs> I believe we do. Um, like Kristen said, I, I only follow DPD on Instagram personally, <laughs> which is maybe more indicative of my social media preferences. But I, I would assume that we do have a, a, a Facebook page. We must have one. Um, I know that I follow DPD on Twitter and uh, Instagram. I do follow Alderman Michael Scott Jr. on Facebook, <laughs> I'll say, but maybe I just have neglected to follow the DPD account, but I'm sure there's gotta be one. I, I know that we kind of post to like cross plat platforms, um, but it, it's a good point as to, uh, you know, what makes it on there and then like, you know, what, what doesn't. Because I know um, I haven't scoured it, but like I don't recall seeing anything about like these. Well, the thing about these surveys is they probably wouldn't have gone on social media because it's for like a select group. So I think that's part of the problem too. Is it's sort of like a direct outreach to like a, a limited um, list of stakeholders. Uh, so, but overall, you know, not everything makes it out to that social media presence. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's, I think, you know, it's, it's selective about what, what goes out there. It's not every, everything, but we are, we are pretty good about getting all the meetings. I know like community meetings out there, uh, you know, particularly related to Invest Southwest and, and things like that, or make it out to the social media platforms. But, um, you know, still a good, great feedback. Here. 
Brian, I am turning it back over to you. Thank you, everyone, for your input. Um, if you have some thoughts, you know, um, after this meeting about the survey, please do send uh, your questions to Caroline or to Brian. I guess Caroline will put her email in the chat for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudette, for joining us today and helping us out with this. Um, it occurred to me that I don't think that you were on one of our um, developer presentations before uh, in North Lawndale before. So this might be the uh, first time that you've uh, been a part of this group, but um, much appreciated. And I think that uh, the conversation was really productive and I'm, I'm glad to hear all the, the feedback, uh, you know, <laughs> even though it's may reflect like on me and the job I'm doing more uh, than open to constructive criticism. And the, the goal here is to make sure these meetings are effective and that we're you know, engaging with folks and people uh, are feeling like they have a chance to be, be heard here. So um, I personally uh, enjoyed uh, hearing the uh, comments and definitely took down some notes. And I, I think there's some great suggestions here from, from everybody and uh, you know, it, it is, you know, we're maybe entering in kind of new frontier here with meetings and the possibility of uh, doing something in person or like, a, you know, I'm more than open to like a rotating schedule here and coming out to the community. Uh, and Jesse, Rodney, Alderman Scott uh, have uh, all seen me out in North Lawndale. And so, I'm, you know, definitely not against uh, coming out and making an in-person appearance or, you know, handing off the reins to, uh, some of our community partners. I think these are all excellent, uh, excellent comments and suggestions. So appreciate that from, from everyone. Um, and thank you, Caroline, too. Sorry, <laughs> thanks to you. But uh, yeah, the survey results are, uh, are, are definitely, um, uh, uh, you know, eye-opening and uh, informative for the rest of the department. Yeah, Brian, I, I'd just like to, to correct you on one thing, and that is, uh, <laughs> you, you've done a great job with this and being inclusive as so is Caroline and being inclusive and ensuring that you got feedback from us and you've come back to us several times and said, hey, how do we improve this? How do we get more engagement? So you guys have been a, a very good partner in this. And so I don't want you to think that you did a failure on your part at all. Uh, it's it, We're all in this together. And so it's going to take all of us to do this heavy lift. And we're we're right there in the trenches with you. I'll, I'll just say a man of that this, this, the the comments were no way reflection on, on what you've done you've been very consistent and very inclusive. Oh, thanks a lot guys uh, yeah I, I appreciate the, the compliment and uh, fully agree that yeah we are all partners in this and so yeah you know I mean if it's not working for the group here and the you know community stakeholders and residents and elected officials then it's not working for us too. So. Uh, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen here and go to our um, move to our next item on the agenda. So uh, there's been a lot going on lately. I, as I, obviously everyone knows, with you know a couple of RFP projects and some projects and plan commission. So I thought it'd be cool to uh, hop in and uh, give a quick update on you know, all the irons that DPD and uh, you know, local developers having the, the fire here and allow folks to ask questions and just you know, kind of have a little bit of a free form uh, chat about new development in the community. So uh, I'm gonna, I just got a few uh, summary slides here about North Lawndale projects, but everyone feel free to uh, jump in and uh, interrupt me as I go from project to project here. This first slide, uh, I also want to mention to you, I believe this is the first meeting that we've had since we announced the selected uh, project for Roosevelt Costner. So mainly, you know, I want to give uh, the folks here a chance to, you know, ask questions or make comments about that. But this slide shows the sort of um, uh, new development projects, particularly as they pertain to, uh, you know, city assistance that are uh, happening in Lawndale right now. So just to kind of go from like top to bottom, uh, the Roosevelt Costner RFP uh, project was just recently announced, I believe earlier in February. 
And uh, so everyone's pretty familiar with that, that site, um, but the uh, project that was selected is gonna be a roughly $41 million investment in the, in the community. Uh, everyone here, I, well, most everyone here, I believe was part of the uh, Ogden Avenue RFP process. So this is the Lawndale Redefined uh, project that's already been announced. Folks have had a chance to meet with the developers here, but uh, that's a, about a $31.5 million project. Um, the Reclaiming Chicago slash 1000 Homes initiative is something that DPD is also contributing to, uh, at least uh, I think roughly two and a half million dollars so far for site remediation. But um, I think the last check-in that was roughly a 27 and a half million dollar project and it will feature about 125 single family homes built on uh, vacant lots in the community. Uh, another project that has been out there for a while and just recently got plan commission approval was the uh, Great Grace Manor uh, Affordable Residential uh, Development. That's gonna be on the south side of Ogden across from our RFP site there. It's about a $31 million project. And then there are a couple of sort of city service like infrastructure type improvements, uh, investing some uh, money in like a, a renovation of Douglas Park Library. And then also the uh, Douglas Park Cultural Center in uh, Douglas Park it's itself there to, uh, additional investments. So for the Roosevelt Costner site, uh, the related Midwest 548 development proposal has been selected as announced by the mayor uh, a few weeks back. So just to you know, recap this, this is uh, going to, it's about on, you know, 21 acres of land. It's gonna include a, a couple of warehouses uh, totaling uh, all in all about 285,000 square feet. These will be built to spec, meaning that there aren't any letters of intent as of right now as to who the, um, uh, the tenants will be on this, uh, but that, that will be you know, announced uh, as the project progresses. Uh, there are also going to be a couple of uh, job training and retail spaces that front Roosevelt Road. Those total about 10,000 square feet in, uh, between the two buildings there. It's gonna have about 250 parking spaces, 66 loading docks between the two warehouse buildings. And it's also going in the middle. This uh, site is bisected by the uh, Lawndale line, uh, you know, future uh, elevated trail that we're working on a plan for right now. And um, we're working to, uh, we're gonna work with the developer and the consultant that's working on the, the Lawndale line planning study to um, come up with some green space and accessibility across the site and have a future connection into that uh, trail. And as of right now, obviously we only have renderings, but uh, this is just another view from that proposal. This would be like the uh, innovation, one of the innovation center buildings over at the uh, corner of, um, like the Southeast corner of the site. Uh, the next project I wanted to uh, bring up, just in case uh, this hasn't, got, hasn't gotten around, but this was in the media some, and it was uh, approved at Plan Commission in January, uh, is the uh, Grace Manor project. So this is 100% affordable multifamily development that is a partnership between the Grace at Jerusalem CDC and East Lake Management uh, Development Corporation. And uh, it's gonna have 65 units in it, it's a six-story building. It's designed by uh, JGMA architects who've done some really fantastic work uh, on the west side, but also just all around the city as well. Uh, there's gonna be a ground floor retail space, a community space uh, that'll have you know, a variety of programming there that's for the residents, but also for the community in general. And as you can see from the uh, images here, it's got a really handsome, uh, kind of you know, front yard open space that'll be landscaped. It'll have some outdoor seating area and uh, engage nicely with, uh, you know, the, the pedestrian realm here for Ogden Avenue right now. So this is located, uh, I showed it in that first slide there, but this is gonna be between uh, uh, Homan and Trumbull on the south side of Ogden Avenue uh, at a site that's currently uh, underused uh, parking lot for the 10th District Police Station.
And uh, I think most folks are familiar with this project, but this is the proposal that was selected for the Ogden Avenue RFP site, uh, proposed by uh, GRE Ventures, Imagine Development, and 548. So this is a partnership between all of them. And uh, this is a mixed use uh, project, you know, ground floor retail, uh, multifamily residential up above. Uh, so it's right now to give you an update on it, uh, we were working with the development team to help them get their application in for low income housing tax credits submitted to the state. Uh, that was just a, a couple of weeks ago in February and uh, they got their application in, you know, DOH, uh, Department of Housing, and DPD are both fully supportive of their application and, uh, you know, worked with them to get all of the appropriate materials in for that. Unfortunately, it's going to be until May or June, I think, uh, until we hear back on whether they got that um, that funding from the state. And, uh, you know, so we're going to have to wait until then uh, to figure out whether that is in place, because that's a key uh, um, part of the financing. Uh, but then DPD will also be, you know, uh, helping to fill the financing gap using TIF funds and maybe utilizing some other sources of, of uh, city incentives as well. So I just wanted to give everyone an update on where we're at with this. Uh, it's going to look like uh, the first phase of the, the project, or at least, you know, the one component that will come at one time is the uh, multifamily residential and the ground floor retail that's connected to it. And uh, in a separate phase, we'll be looking at uh, that community center uh, that is focused on arts and technology and the uh, grocer and restaurant space. Uh, so we've had to kind of break this up just due to the limitations of the funding that we're looking at and like what certain types of funds can and can't be used for. But uh, we're definitely looking at moving all the components of this ahead. There's a really nice plaza uh, that's located in front of the, uh, uh, in the kind of front, front yard here uh, that engages again with Ogden Avenue uh, and tries to really improve the pedestrian environment there, similar to the project across the street. And uh, yeah, that's that's all I've got for right now. Uh, you know, we'll continue to update the group as these projects advance. But did anyone have any questions about any of these projects? I know it's been talked about a lot in the community. A timing for the uh, Lundell redefine. I know we're waiting for the low income tax credit, but do they have projected uh, start date for this project? So yeah, we're we're looking to. Uh, at least i don't know about construction start date but the goal is to have all of the the plan commission and city council approvals wrapped up by the end of this year uh i mean i know that that's not an aggressive timeline uh and it, you know I, I certainly wish that we could move more quickly on this but uh that state uh deadline or the state timeline for the low-income housing tax credits is a limitation for us. And the reason why the project is pursuing the state tax credits in the state as opposed to DOH is that they're trying to get a 9% credits, which gets them a higher amount of funding. Yeah. And DOH does do 9% uh, low income housing tax credits, but it's only every other year. So if they were to apply for that through DOH, that would put them even farther out, unfortunately. So we're kind of beholden to that, that timeline there. But, you know, I mean, if everything came together, you know, well, and uh, we move according to plan here, I mean, maybe, you know, shovels on the ground, spring 23. Spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Brian, what's the cross streets on this? Hey, Alderman. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, so this is on Ogden Avenue uh, between Homan and uh, Trumbull. No, I'll, I'll pop back to that map. Oh, thanks. Oh, oops. Yeah, right here. So, uh, yeah, the streets aren't labeled very well on this. This is kind of just like a, you know, overview um, exhibit here. But, you know, this is the uh, um, Ogden and West Southwest corridor kind of going from the west side of the park uh, out to Pulaski, or actually from, sorry, from Kedzie to Pulaski. And uh, this is on uh, a block of city-owned land that's on that corridor. Yeah, it's 
And I, sh I should also mention to you that the, uh, the Grace Manor project that's across the street from there did receive low income housing tax credits from DOH and it also received uh, some DOH capital funds through the uh, home program as well as TIF funding from, from DPD. So that's, that's another project that is, uh, you know, wouldn't have happened at least not on the current timeline without uh, city assistance. Anyone else have any questions, comments? Hello, hi, this is a Pratt of Austin. Um, we want to, uh, as far as breaking ground on the Roosevelt and Costner project, is it the same timeline for the Ogden? So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my uh, colleague, Mike Perella, has been managing that, that project so far, the RFP, but uh, that's going to be headed over to me to uh, take it through the uh, plan commission review process. Um, we just having announced it, uh, actually this week, we have a meeting with the, the development team and we really haven't fleshed out that, that timeline yet, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, you know, more to come on that, but uh, I, I think there's a lot of moving pieces with, um, you know, getting the financing in place for it. And then also, you know, making sure like the, uh, the site is prepared, remediated to, move ahead with um, you know, construction on it. So let me, uh, let me get back to you on that one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, well, getting to the end, that's the end here fairly early and uh, I don't wanna hold anyone up uh, <laughs> for giving you back a few minutes here. So I just want to thank uh, everyone again for joining us. And we're going to take some of those suggestions that we discussed earlier and uh, get back to you, uh, you know, in uh, hopefully in short order here about uh, some, you know, improvements that might be coming to the, these meetings. So, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll call it here. Thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a great afternoon. All right. Thanks, Maya.